So here's a familiar story. You drive to a nearby gas station to fill up your car, and as the meter goes up and up, you start to realize that the price of gas is unexpectedly spiked. Annoyed, you probably start to curse the gas station and the oil companies for this highway robbery. But who should you really be blaming for the spike in prices? It's a simple matter of supply and demand. Perhaps you should blame your neighbors. It's July and your neighbors have decided to take a cross-country family vacation. Along the way, they stop at many gas stations and buy far more gas than they normally do during the rest of the year. But your neighbors aren't alone. Thousands of other families are also on summer vacation. Together, they're buying millions of gallons of gas. This increase in the demand for gasoline causes the price of gas to rise. Perhaps you should blame the weather. A hurricane thousands of miles away can disrupt the gasoline supply lines across many countries by damaging or forcing the evacuations of drilling rigs. This decrease in the supply of gasoline causes the price of gas to rise. When an event affects a market, like a drought or a war or the invention of a new technology, we want to know two things. First, what happens to the price of the good? And second, what happens to the quantity of the good that is bought and sold? Consider two events that affect the market for gasoline. In summer, people travel more, so people buy more gas, and the price of gas rises. When a hurricane disrupts oil production, the price of gas rises, and people buy less gas. In both of these examples, the price of gas rises, but in one example, people buy more gas, in the other, they buy less gas. When there's a good growing season, the price of food falls, and people buy more food. When people's incomes rise, they buy more food, and the price of food rises. In both of these examples, people buy more food. But in one example, the price of food falls, in the other, the price of food rises. So sometimes, price and consumption move in the same direction, and sometimes they move in opposite directions. To make sense of markets, economists use conceptual tools called demand and supply. We start by dividing the market into two sets of players. Consumers are those who are willing to exchange their dollars for goods and services. Producers are those who are willing to exchange their goods and services for dollars. There are many things that influence how much consumers are willing to pay for a good. The consumer's tastes, how much money they have to spend, the prices of other goods they could buy instead, their beliefs, their expectations about the future and about themselves. Combining all of these things gives us demand. Demand summarizes consumers' behavior in the marketplace. Don't confuse demand with the amount of good consumers want. Quantity demanded is the number of units consumers want to buy. Demand is the behavior of consumers. Similarly, there are many things that influence how much producers charge in exchange for a good. The cost of the materials, the producer uses in production, how much productive capacity the producer has, how many other producers there are, and the producer's beliefs and expectations about the future. Combining all of these things gives us supply. Supply summarizes producers' behavior in the marketplace. Don't confuse supply with the amount of goods producers offer. Quantity supplied is the number of units producers are willing to offer for sale. Supply is the behavior of the producers. You now have the two primary tools economists use in thinking about human behavior, supply and demand. To understand markets, we begin by separating the behavior of producers and consumers. We then recombine them together to predict the impact of events on markets.